Welcome, Internet, to Makers on Tap, the podcast where the makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff in the maker culture. I am your host, Christian, and joining me tonight are... Aaron. And Joe. Awesome. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a whole range of different things, from maker news to leadership about the makerspace, and our main topic, and we're going to get into that here in a minute. Uh, but first, as always, as we get into these podcasts, we always talk about what we are drinking tonight. Uh, I personally had a cider going into tonight. I had my old dependable Angry Orchard because you can never go wrong with an Angry Orchard. You always go wrong with Angry Orchard. <laughs> <laughs> well, then what are the rest of you guys drinking tonight? I'm doing a Boulevard Wheat Beer. Nice. I'm act- I've actually got a uh, a bit of Tanner's apple cider from Ooh. the local apple orchard mixed with uh, the good old Kirkland vodka because that thing is huge and I have a lot of it left. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, see, we we're talking about good. Um, what was it doing the brewing classes that we would like to be able to do here in the future. Uh, and I know one of our members was talking about possibly trying to get a membership or a a deal between us and our local orchard for cider specifically to possibly get that stuff. And I, man, it would be awesome to get some of Tanner's like actual cider for yeah. our brewing classes. That would be. Oh. Yeah, it would. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Uh, first thing we're going to jump into is the maker news. Uh, first of all, we have a new subreddit. Uh, we just created that this week. Um, the r slash makers on tap is the URL for our subreddit. Uh, if you're interested in being able to communicate in that space. Um, the other thing that we've also announced is we have a Facebook group. Uh, if you search makers on tap on Facebook, we'll be posting uh, updates, pictures, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, from our adventures in the makerspace and beyond. Uh, we also have an Instagram on um, same thing, Makers on Tap. Uh, last night we had our first po- or photo of us, all of us. So if you're interested in what the faces behind the voices are, uh, we will gladly disappoint you with that. So <laughs> <laughs> um, feel free to check that out. Give us a follow. We'll be making sure to post different kinds of updates throughout the time uh, and also be sharing links on stuff that interests us and uh, news topics that we'll be talking about throughout the week. Um, Then we also have, we are opening our, uh, we are open to having some other things on the subreddit and Facebook group. So if you would like to be able to contribute to that, please feel free to reach out to us and be able to talk about that. Uh, so our yeah. first actual piece of maker news, Aaron, do you want to go into the Microsoft Visual Studios? I'll, I'll touch on it. I just wanted to poke at it. Sure. So Microsoft's Azure Cloud went down uh, this week. I think it was on Tuesday. Uh, they actually had a severe weather storm thing in their south, southern U.S. data center, and it took down their entire cloud service for like the entire day. Whoa. So, <laughs> Yeah. Dang. Yeah. So on one hand, I didn't get to do any work all day, which is nice. <laughs> um, on the I other hand, to bring this up so we can just say good. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm glad that Microsoft went down for a day. Uh... That's all I wanted to talk about. <laughs> yeah. There's like the one hand, like Aaron didn't get to work for one day, and on the other hand, it's like <laughs> Aaron didn't have to work for a day. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Uh, I don't actually have anything to talk about. I just wanted to hate on Microsoft for a little bit. So, no, of course. that's all good. Uh, well, we're equal opportunity haters. Last week we were beating up on Slack, who we really like, you know, and this week we're beating we're up on Microsoft, on, who we're, yeah. we don't really like. So, exactly. it's all good. Right. Awesome. Yes. So, uh, uh, yeah. Next piece. Yeah. So, the uh, Tackle on Dawn or Seven Dawn now available for free access download. Uh, who wants to take on that one? So, tra- is it Traction? It's Traction. It's traction. Traction. Yeah. Traction. Traction 7. Okay. Da, which is actually super relevant to us because we're trying to figure out which digital audio workstation we should do this in still. Um, 
is av- now available for free download, which is cross-platform, so it's all three of your favorite computer systems or the two that you love to hate. Um, but yes, it's still not open source. Yes, it's technically really? freeware. Yeah, it's, it's, it's closed source freeware, which is funny that Aaron's excited about it, but it is cl- yeah, well. it is cross-platform. So I'm not entirely excited about it, but I put it on the list here because it is now, you know, it's a Linux version and anything that comes to Linux, regardless if it's open or closed is is a good good thing for Linux. So yeah, yeah. More options are always good. So I was kind of excited to see that. Absolutely. Uh, And then this is going to be kind of a larger piece of uh, maker news because I feel like we all want to talk about this a little bit uh, before we jump into the main topic and that is uh, Gizmodo released an article on a huge exposure within the Octoprint software that a lot of us use to be able to run our 3D printers remotely. Um, this was a kind of big piece of news um, within the community uh, that kind of opened a lot of people's eyes I feel like to kind of a big vulnerability in the software. Uh, well, so, well, it's not well, a vulnerability okay. in the software. Maybe maybe Christian should read the article next time. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, okay. <laughs> when I say vulnerability, I mean it has a setting that's enabled by default that should be enabled. No, 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 no. Christian should read the Christian article Christian should read time. the article. It's, an, it's not enabled by default. So, it yeah, it's, forces it's the user. you initially the end user is the vulnerability anyway what's the problem aaron so the problem <laughs> is that uh the end users the people who are installing octoprint servers no no, no hang on what's the real problem here uh, you're skipping ahead of yourself yeah, yeah yeah so the real problem are the end users the the developers <laughs> of the uh, software this is like that one episode are, we did <laughs> yeah so the yes exactly so the developers you know know what's know what's best for the software and they have sane defaults in safe defaults hang on oh, hang on hang on hang on let me let me let me do this all right so the real problem here is all of these octoprint instances that were found by the security researchers are freely open and accessible to the internet so that means there is accessible printers are able to be logged on to remotely by anyone with no username and no password authentication. I was building up to that. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah, I think the biggest thing that we're having an issue or, well, that is the issue is there's the end user is not enacting those authentications. They well, are so actively disabling them. That's the problem. Yes. By default, it requires you to set up a user and password. But what the end users are doing, which are the root cause, is that they are actively disabling authentication methods. So they are actively going into the settings and saying, uh, I'm not, I don't want to bother with signing into my Octoprint server. I just want to plug in my IP address and, and go away. Yep. Oh. So okay. that's so the problem. I, yeah. No, I absolutely misunderstood that. I... No, that's yeah. my bad. <laughs> it, in the that's startup wizard, to me. <laughs> it, the, it happens to the best of us. One of the main parts of the startup wizard is create a username and password to log in. They don't even give you a default username and password because they don't want you to go that route. That's mm-hmm. really good, too. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the big IoT vulnerability issues are due to default username and passwords. Yeah. I, so I, it's great that they make you just set it at the onset. It it makes me sad to think how many routers are out there that still have admin admin as their username and password. Right. But yeah, without going too deep into this, this is a problem. And it leads us into our topic for the night, which is Christian. Christian is our topic of the night. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so our main topic for tonight is using the right tool um, and trying to uh, get the... Re- using the right tool for the job is the topic for the night. Um, it came from an idea that I had for a potential book, maybe, later in life, entitled, A Wrench is Not a Hammer, Damn It, and Other Things That My Dad Used to Yell at Me. 
<laughs> at least your dad yelled at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, so absolutely. So this is um, something that we wanted to hit on, especially uh, something that we've been uh, encountering a lot recently with not only uh, moving our makerspace and going through that whole process, uh, but also something in our personal projects that has been uh, something that look, it does need to be talked about. It's something that actually helps you as a maker make better decisions mm -hmm. uh, and be able to think about things more clearly. Um, yeah, that's it. it. It's been something that we wanted to talk about for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I'm not necessarily going to start, but one thing I would like to kind of cover in this topic is not only using the right tool, but using the right tool rightly or correctly. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, which, which is what the Octoprint discussion kind of hinted at. So, yeah. Uh, Joe, so this is, Joe, this is your idea for the topic. Did you have something particular in mind you wanted to well, uh, kick us off with? Um, so I, I think when people get started um, in their maker adventure, they a lot of times when they come into the maker space, they say, uh, I want to learn the specific tool, whether it's I want to learn how to use a laser cutter to make X project or I want to learn how to use the 3D printer to make uh, Y project. Um, and then a lot of times it seems like they get kind of downtrodden when they come and talk to uh, one of us that are very versed in the tool and we say, well, you know, why do you want to use the 3D printer for that? Maybe that's not the best tool. Maybe we should go. Um, maybe we should go back and uh, take a look at the CNC router for that that project. Or um, maybe instead of using the 3D printer, maybe that's a better candidate for laser cutting. And then they get kind of flustered because they're like, "But I want to learn how to use." But I want to use the 3D printer for that. Um, right. And, you know, a, a lot of times you have to take a step back and say, okay, what's your real goal there? Uh, do you just want to learn how to use the 3D printer? Or uh, do you want to accomplish your project? Because if we're going to accomplish your project, we should take a look at using the right tool. Um, because, you know, a wrench isn't a hammer. Um, and, and sometimes... I think it kind of falls into that the old saying, uh, uh, when your only tool is a hammer, the whole world looks like nails. Yep. Um, yeah. Or or I used to like to say, when your only tool is a laser cutter, everything looks like quarter-inch Baltic birch plywood. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't flow as nice, but <laughs> it's there. <laughs> um, so uh, it, taking a step back and looking at your project and looking at the merits of the tools that you have available to you. You know, sometimes you're going to 3d print regardless because that's the only tool that you have and you want to accomplish your project. But if you have a makerspace with a plethora of tools, I think it's important to take a step back and say, what, what's your real goal? And if your real goal is accomplishing the project in the best manner possible, Maybe you need to learn how to new, use a new tool, or maybe you need to uh, take advice and uh, use the tool that the expert suggested for a reason. Well, um, and there's there's so many instances of, uh, I think, especially in our own lives, of using the right tool for something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, particularly something that comes to my mind is... Um, I can't go into a lot of details because obviously we all work with very sensitive equipment. We can't exactly talk about we, what we want, but I work with this one piece of equipment where um, it is buried deep within the projectors that I work on. And uh, if I want to get to a specific screw, I can get to it a manner of different ways. But if I want to actually get to it correctly and get the job done right, then I have to use an extender and all this kind of stuff. And at first I didn't know that and I didn't have any idea. But once I did, I was able to start cranking through those way quicker. I went from what was normally a 45 minute job to being dang near a 20 minute job. 
And yeah. it's all because I started using that right tool to be able to do all that kind of stuff. And there's a, like you're saying, there's so many people who come into the makerspace who are excited about 3D printing. And that's awesome. They absolutely should be. And we're excited to have them in there. But they, they get so fixated on 3D printing um, that they lose sight that, hey, we could actually help you do this even better, especially when it comes to prototyping and stuff like that, like people wanting to do cool stuff with their projects. We have people who come in and they're like, oh, well, I want to do this and it involves water. I want to 3D print it. It's like, well, maybe that's not the best option for you. <laughs> but we have all of these other tools to help you out. And they, they kind of lose the, the spark behind it. Yeah. Um, but it is something that there is so many other tools that you can use. You just have to put in a little work to, to learn them. Yep. It's something I used to run into a lot as well professionally i would i would have uh people come to me and, and they'd be like oh i i i saw i i always fall back to 3d printing but it was it was constant you know I, I saw this really awesome project and I, I think that we could take this widget that somebody else created and then we should 3d print it and then we can market it as 3d printed and i'm like but it's worse than uh <laughs> <laughs> why would we do that right uh, there, there was some really good examples that I can't go into because uh, NDAs every, and stuff. Everything should be open source, so it's easy to talk about. <laughs> this is true, but Op open source everything. Yeah, I was just working on something this week. Uh, I had, um, I am borrowing one of those two point five watt Chinese Elix Maker laser engravers. And I've been working on printing and updating, uh, modifying the, the laser so it's actually workable and better. And one of the, um, I got it working and I was going to try and get a, uh, one of those, uh, what's it called? Like a cable guard or cable chain, a drag chain. Yeah. Like, a, like, yeah, a, yeah. Drag chain. Yeah. So a lot of people print them, which can take out a, a very long time, a long print. time. Mm -hmm. Um, I could, I could just order it on Amazon, which is probably what I'm going to do, but I saw a design on Thingiverse for a laser cut drag chain. I'm like, oh, well I have a laser right here. <laughs> yep. I'm going to try that. Well, with a 2.5 watt, you know, laser, it took me, I was going at like, oh my gosh, like five millimeters a second, which is super slow. Right. At, you know, hundred percent power at seven or eight passes. And for the whole drag, the whole drag chain took about three hours to actually cut it all. And then it didn't even come out right. And it didn't, it didn't work well. And I bring this up because that diode laser was not the right tool for the job, but it was the only tool I had mm -hmm. to make the job done. Yeah. If I was at the makerspace, I could have used the CO2 laser, which would have taken under a minute to do the exact same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Still probably not the right tool for the job, but... <laughs> Sometimes when you find designs on the internet, they're not well thought out. <laughs> Which I, I think is part of what You're you ran wrong. into there. <laughs> well, I mean, they come up with really cool concepts. They just mm -hmm. may not have thought through it all the way. Well, a lot of times I've run into somebody put a design on the internet, but they never actually made it. So mm. there's no proof that it works. And that's something I've run into a lot on things like uh, Thingiverse or somebody brings me a model off of GrabCAD. And, uh, you know, it was ah. it was just meant to be a like placeholder model in uh, like a virtual representation of something never supposed to be 3D printed and is completely not 3D printable. And they're upset because they, they want to 3D print it. Um, yeah. That used to happen a lot to me mm -hmm. at my big yellow tractor job. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, it, another concern, though, which is huge, is safety. Um, yeah. A lot of tools, when used improperly, uh, go from being incredibly safe to extremely dangerous. Um, a really good example of something that gets misused constantly uh, is flathead screwdrivers. Uh, you know, they're, they're soft because they're made to not destroy screw heads. Uh, so when you use them for a pry bar or a chisel, they quickly become projectiles. And that's a, never fun. 
And then when the next guy goes to use it and he pulls out this flathead screwdriver that's now a prison shank, it's completely useless to him. Um, or, it, or, you know, you forgot that you used it for a chisel last time and you need to remove a screw. And now it's a prison shank and it's completely useless to you. So, but now it's like a super valuable prison shank, right? When the when, like, when the you, zombie apocalypse comes, it's yeah. important. Well, now right. now now you just entered a secondary market for your tools. <laughs> where once they're broken, you can then market them to the local prisons, right? Well, and the other thing is, uh, you know, using things like needle nose pliers as a wrench, and depending on the situation that you're in, uh, you know, that could turn into a, a broken hand depending on how much pressure you're doing. And then your, your nut is now rounded off and uh, your knuckles are all bloody and everything hurts. Uh, yeah. Well, and that's, I feel like we get to a point um, so many times where a lot of us get frustrated and we just start brute forcing it. And we ended up making it so much worse when it's just like, if we would have taken five minutes to be able to just sit aside and be like, Hey, this is frustrating. <laughs> I know I'm dealing with this, but I need to think about this in the right manner and come back at it again. That's actually an uh, idea for a whole nother episode, which is know when to walk away and take a second look later. Yeah, Yeah. that'd be a great one. No, absolutely. It's one of those things where it's like we just. It kind of ties in with so much stuff in the makerspace because so many things come up where it's like we we help each other out to be able to figure these kind of things out um yeah. there's there's been so many times where uh i'm an extremely creative person i i went to school to be a vfx artist um got involved in engineering and technician work uh by accident um and just kind of fell into this and i fell into this love and so i've come so many times to the makerspace and be like i want to do this and this is freaking awesome and I want to do all this. And it's just like, you got to kind of think about what you're actually going to be doing with this stuff because there's a lot easier ways of doing it. Yeah. And and there's often a lot safer ways to do yeah. it than, than what you're trying to accomplish. A, a good example is um, even though a lot of times a table saw is totally the right tool for the job, I'll do almost anything to get out of using a table saw. I have a lot of hours in front of a table saw blade. I hate using them, though, because, it, you know, the number one creator of uh, lost time incidents in, the, in a workshop based workplace is a table saw. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they're they're terrifying. <laughs> and our table saw, especially we have a beast of a cabinet saw and uh it won't forgive so i try to avoid using it at all costs no absolutely that you know on the creative side too though there's always like um trying to create graphics you know when when do you dive into a raster based program versus a vector based program um Mm -hmm. You know, that knowledge is super valuable. Uh, do you have any tips for that, Christian? Um, yeah, because that's been something that's like come up a lot recently is um, is being able to actually decide when the best software is to use. Um, it's it's a really hard one to judge because so many of us who are doing creative type work, um, a I'm speaking from my field uh, when I was doing VFX and uh, video composition and all that um, is you get so comfortable in a tool that you like using. Um, When we first started recording the podcast, I actually wanted to go into Premiere for a second rather than audition because I knew where everything was in that. Um, And that's such a backwards way of thinking. Right. Uh, Because like audition, I have it available to me. But it was like, oh, I already knew where all these things were. But it's like, man, if I just would have taken the time to be able to actually look at the tools inside of Audition, it would have been so much cleaner and looked so much better uh, coming out. And that's something that you can get into the habit of is like, yeah, there is so many things that uh, you get comfortable with 
but you should absolutely try and venture out there. Uh, as for like knowing when that time is, that's really depending on what you're going to pop out as the final project. Um, recently, I did some artwork for some cabinets uh, that I have in my house for display cabinets. And I designed the whole thing in Photoshop, popped it out as an SVG to cut it on our vinyl cutter. And that was not the best thing because I totally needed to be using a Illustrator-based program to do it in vectors. Mm -hmm. And it was all about knowing that final end product. And if I just would have taken the time to do that same amount of work in uh, Illustrator, would have been fine. But because I did it in Photoshop, because that's so what I'm used to, I ended up having to redo that work. And it really wasn't even me. It was Joe was helping me through that process of learning it in an even better program, which is open sourced, um, in which Inkscape. Is, was it Inkscape? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. So he helped me in Inkscape to be able to uh, import that file, take it, pop it out as an SV, or SVG in a vector base, and then go through the whole process in order to be able to cut it on our vinyl cutter. And so there's even times where we're talking about like stuff in the makerspace and tools and stuff, but it really does pertain, pertain to a whole bunch of other stuff in your life where it's like, you just could be maybe needing to rethink the software that you're using to get to the end base of what you're actually thinking about. One thing that I see a lot is people get entrenched in a certain software or a certain technology or a certain tool. Yeah. And they're not open to looking at alternatives. And that's kind of where a big problem lies is you need to be open to trying out new things because, you know, there probably is a better tool out there and you just don't know it. No, Boy. Fair enough. You should take your own advice sometimes. Ah, get out of here. I know get out of here. I know he was setting me up for that one. He wanted me to take that bait, but I was like, ah. Uh. <laughs> no, yeah. I... Go ahead. It, it, um, it's, a, it's a pretty common thing that I've run into with uh, people coming and asking for help, and they're like, hey, I've, I, I want to... Uh, trace this image in AutoCAD mm. and I'm like no <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean you you could I guess if you're a glutton for punishment and you've got six pots of coffee but we could move over to this graphic design tool Inkscape and I could literally do it for you in three clicks depending on how good the quality of the image is and it uh, other factors uh, but you know, in uh in christian's case with his photoshop image it was it was the three click thing we had it done in just a couple seconds um so yeah you know, being open to trying new things is really really big I, um in the tool selection environment no absolutely yeah so i'd like to kind of expand this discussion you know i, I hinted at it before but using the right tool correctly. You can use the right tool, but not do it correctly. So, Oh, yeah. We had hinted at it earlier with the Octoprint article, which I'd love to dive in a little bit more into. Yeah. It doesn't need to get too technical, but... This is a great time to do so it. The, yeah, so the, the main issue w with um, the article was there are there was something like 32,000 some Octoprint servers are, are exposed to the Internet without any sort of authentication, which means I th logging in with a username and password. I thought it was like 3,900. Not uh, 3,759 were yes. uh, the exact okay. number of instances. Thank you. So nowhere near as bad as I said. <laughs> just, a, <laughs> just a factor of 10 off. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so they are, the idea is that they are, uh, anybody essentially with the IP address could log in not even log in. They just plug in the IP address, and you just get to the Octoprint um, interface. the The problem is that these people are actively going out of their way to disable these security measures. The developers have even said that, you know, we 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 designed this so that it will be secure using good standard security practices, which is set up a your own custom username and password at the initial setup, and that's what you use to log in. Um, and it's an, it's, it's an option that you have to go out of your way for to disable all of that. So it comes down to, you know, the developers have done everything they can to make sure 
this software is secure if you follow the defaults, which is, is good software design. But now we have a, an increasing number of users who are actively going out of their way to disable that for who knows why. You know, that's a very odd reason. Um, Octoprint is a very good solution for remote print management. Uh, so you could argue that that is the right tool for that job. What we're seeing is now some users are using that right tool incorrectly. Um, it, it's a very interesting conversation because you're now talking about an engineering uh, solution to handle 3D printing jobs, but you're now running into technology or IT related issues with authentication, username, and passwords, security, web interfaces, all that stuff, which most, you know, mechanical manufacturing engineers might not have experience in. So, but why is that I, dangerous, Aaron? I mean, if somebody wanted to log into my printer remotely and, and see what's going on, why do I care? It's, it's, it's really, uh, it's an interesting thought. Because it could really go any sort of way. So if you think of the average 3D printer, you've got plastic thread getting pushed through some superheated metal metal nozzle. Um, with Octoprint, you can remotely start prints. You can upload custom G-code, which is kind of like 3D print blueprints that your printer then interprets and prints. Um, I believe you can also flash firmware. You can. Yeah, which is one of the things they mentioned in the article as being iffy. So if anybody had found... So one thing mentioned in this article was Shodan. It's kind of like Google, but for IoT devices, specifically insecure IoT devices. Shodan is a search engine for IoT devices that have bad authentication or no authentication and that's how they found these so anybody could use this shodan google type uh, search engine get the ip address of these uh, these affected servers just plug in the numbers into your browser and now you got some random person's you know octoprint interface what you could do then is you could go ahead and print some sort of uh you know sex toy on the, on some random person's printer um it's not a problem now but you could print a gun on somebody's printer yeah which is not a problem now but you know who's to say if the government outlaws it you can just log into someone's insecure you know server and, and print something illegal um you could also you know, i'm sure you guys have seen heard the news stories of random chinese printers catching fire and burning houses down oh yeah um yeah. with octoprint's ability to remotely flash firmware you could upload a custom firmware because usually octoprint will save the name of the printer yeah in the interface so you could figure out the specific printer being used um modify your own firmware that disables all of the the heating stuff so you could say just heat as go as hot as you can go no limit and just you know you could see if it could burn a house down so it's and it's not an if it's a it's a when 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 someone does that yeah. So normally, you you a lot of people probably heard all the IoT Internet of Things horror stories of oh my toaster no longer works because it lost internet connection or ah oh, my IoT fridge became part of a botnet. <laughs> those aren't like those are bad in general, but it's not life threatening, and it's not going to affect you as a person. I mean, this is actually a huge issue because it could burn your house down. Yeah. Or you know, this is a this actually has physical ramifications, whereas before we normally your insecure IoT things usually just become part of a botnet and just does like D DDoS attacks on things, or, which a lot of people don't understand. Or mines so. Bitcoin for for some. Yeah. So normally these insecure devices aren't a huge deal, but this is actually a super big deal because it's a fire hazard. Well, it's a fire hazard, and you know. If burning your house down doesn't trip your bells, it's just as easy to burn out your 3D printer that you spent all this time hooking this thing up. It, simply flash firmware for a different board, and there's a really solid chance that you're going to put power to pins that shouldn't have power, and the magic smoke gets let out. 
and it's it's a really can't e- let easy that magic thing. smoke out. Yeah, it's really hard to put back. Yeah, it's really hard to put back. Yeah, you need a magic smoke collector. Which let me know if you if you figure that out. Yeah, I'll, I will be a millionaire, a gajillion. <laughs> Literally, tens of dollars could be made with that. Um, yeah. So, best case scenario, you end up with a dildo in your printer. <laughs> <laughs> um, medium case there scenario. goes our family friendly for this episode <laughs> well, well you already cursed earlier so we're good uh, um, yeah. so either you get that in your printer medium case scenario your printer dies worst case house fire yeah and they're all super legitimate concerns so what's the right way around that because you know earlier we were talking about um, setting up a, a a dynamic DNS uh, to make it easier to remote in, but that's definitely not the most secure way to go about it. You know, that's still breakable. Um, is setting is up a VPN the right way to go? Is It's an interesting challenge because we are now running, you know, the DIY community in general is becoming larger. People are actually looking into doing things themselves, you know, cheaper, which is great. But that comes at a greater risk because you know you need to maybe even slightly understand the ramifications of the choices that you make with technology right um because what we're seeing if you just follow like if i just install octoprint and just follow the on-screen instructions you end up with a secure server like they take care of that for you you know as they should for good software what we're seeing are people making active choices to disable that and that's the problem um and, and they may not realize the ramifications of the decisions they're making yeah i i think anyone who's smart enough to turn off the authentication um is smart enough to understand the ramifications if they understood they were there if that makes sense i don't know so my first thought when i saw this is maybe there's some guide online some oh guide yeah online because everybody googles how to's uh-huh yeah. there's probably some awful how-to out there that says oh well just as able the authentication it's a hassle well in the potentially those guides are malicious yeah yeah so often i google how to do blah blah blah, blah in debian 9 and then blindly copy and paste code from that article into my terminal Don't we <laughs> to all? accomplish Don't we all my know? goal. <laughs> and Everybody who runs Linux is a trustful person. <laughs> right. And, you know, I one time I got suspicious of the code, so I looked into the source of the blog, and it was in China. So, you know, nice. I was probably copying botnet instructions onto my server and whatever uh here's here's a pro tip joe um if you're not uh always uh copy paste your linux commands into notepad okay um because there's been some vulnerabilities where you can hide code in uh oh in characters and don't take space so so if you put you could take it out of uh the web page put it in notepad notepad doesn't uh, most most text editors don't recognize invisible characters. Mm-hmm. So then you actually see if it's malicious, you'll see more code pop up than what you actually pasted in because mm-hmm. they were hidden. Hmm. And so that, that that's a good uh, rule of thumb to do uh, when you're copying stuff off the internet because then you can kind of, you know, become your own firewall, I guess. Right. And check that stuff. Learning things every day with makers yeah. on tap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you should put that in the show notes. That's a good tip. I might, if I remember. No, that's, that's... you can put that in the timeline, and then I'll pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron gives insightful Linux advice. <laughs> We're starting a timeline in the show notes. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, if you. We should say this at the beginning because they've already shut off if we dove too technical. 
<laughs> yeah, Fair it, enough. It, if you feel that a certain part of the show is too technical and you want to jump around, we're going to start adding times into show notes so that you can get to the, the meat of the show that you'd like to get to and ignore our ranty bits and maker news. Um, if you feel we didn't get technical enough, go to our website, makersontap.com slash contact us or whatever, and send us an email and be like, you totally glazed over this thing or that. And I will happily expand on it. Yeah, we'll we'll wax poetic on Linux and 3D printing and anything. We would love to talk shop with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. We want to build more of a community. So Which is why we made so many outlets this week. Yes. (laughs) So we want you guys to get active and, and give us feedback. Let us know what you think. Top you know, new ideas for topics, thoughts on episodes. We'd love to build that community with you guys and get that face-to-face interaction we'd love that so well at least keyboard to keyboard (laughs) yes keyboard to keyboard (laughs) absolutely if you guys do want to see any of us face to face this weekend i will be in chicago at imts uh the international machine tool show or manufacturing technology show i always get that confused i guess this is going to come out right after i get back though I'll still be there for one day after this comes out. I'll be there on Tuesday. So maybe we'll try awesome. to push this a little early. <laughs> um, I will say other quick news um, that we kind of rush into the topic, but uh, we are still moving. We have been kind of really excited through the process of doing so. The move is going great. We actually uh, have made a podcast studio that we're going to be having at our new makerspace uh, that looks amazing, and we cannot wait to start recording in there. Uh, We've also started to lay out the makerspace, and if you would like to be able to uh, check out pictures and stuff like that, uh, we'll be posting some stuff to our social media on the uh, River City Labs. So if you're interested in... Uh, possibly seeing the progress of the move and what our new makerspace is going to be looking like. Please follow us on all of those as well. Uh, And then my final piece is um, I want to say thank you to everybody. We've been seeing a lot of uh, crazy awesome growth on the podcast uh, from people who have been sharing it uh, and going through and just posting it everywhere and allowing the community to naturally grow and for everybody who is out there listening. Uh, we wanted to thank two groups individually. Uh, one, the Peoria Podcast Alliance. Uh, quite a few of them have been announcing us on their podcast, and I only feel it's right that we give them the same uh, dudality to just say thank you to all of them who have been promoting us as well. Uh, we'll thank a few of them, Champagne Tuesday, Dishing Disney, Final Reckoning, and a, quite a few others. Um, we actually just had one of them offer for us to be on a karaoke podcast, um, yeah. which um, I think would be a really cool guest opportunity for a lot of us to be able to go on there and check that out. Uh, the only other one that uh, we were going to say thank you to is the Insert Disc Podcast, which has mentioned us on theirs. Uh, they found us and were talking about us as well, just saying really cool stuff about us. So if you are from them, thank you for listening uh, all the way through to our rambling. Uh, and thank you for being a part of such an awesome community. Uh, that wraps up my stuff. Do you guys have anything else you want to mention? No, uh, come find us on social media. It's Makers on Tap on just about everything now. I need to get our Twitter up. And then uh, River City Labs Peoria on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those things. uh, If you want to see what's going on with the Makerspace. Um, Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, you guys have a great week, uh, and we will see you back next time. Bye-bye. Keep making stuff. Later.